Let's go fishing in Newfoundland. And let's accompany Lee Wolf, the internationally famous sportsman, and Jack Young, one of the island's top guides, as they seek the hiding places of the big trout. Angling success often depends upon finding the right fly for each situation. And here, the guide chooses a long streamer on a number four hook. Slender flies of this type are excellent imitations of the small fish which form the basic diet of the larger trout. An early morning sun slants down over the rugged mountains to touch the clear, cool waters of one of Newfoundland's trout pools as the fly goes out to the deep flow near the far bank. The hook is set when a trout rises from the depths in a surging strike. In these clear northern streams, the trout are strong, hard fighters. But Lee is an expert angler and matches every rush and run of the trout with just the right amount of tackle tension. The tackle gives and gives, but never quite gives the fish his freedom. When the trout grows tired, the pull of the light rod and the hold of the hook are strong enough to draw the fish within range of the landing net. This is an eastern brook trout of about two and a half pounds, ordinarily a prize to be proud of. But as Lee holds it up for inspection, the guide shows disapproval. The trout of this river run large, he explains, and a mere two and a half pounder just isn't up to the river's standard and should be released. Further down the pool, another trout comes out of the shadowed depths to strike the fly and feel the bite of the steel. The rod bends again as this trout pits his strength against Lee's tackle skill. Deep open water simplifies the playing of the fish, and for the trout this proves to be a losing battle. Although the three pound test leader is not strong enough to lift his weight from the water, it brings him ever closer to the angler. With a slow and steady sweep, the landing net lifts the tired fish from the stream. A trout of more than three pounds this time, but the guide still shakes his head, and this beautiful fish, too, goes back to the river. Fishing, however, is an uncertain sport at best, and even in such wilderness waters as these, there are times when even the most skillful angler's efforts may go unrewarded. After an hour's fruitless casting, Lee comes back to the canoe to sit with Jack and talk the situation over. The guide believes the big trout have left this pool and may have gone to a deep and narrow flow of cold spring water which enters the main stream about a quarter of a mile below them. The canoe slides downstream easily with the smooth run of the current. And when they turn into the narrow channel with its overhanging alders, their first glance shows that big trout, and plenty of them, have congregated here. Although this looks like a scene from a fish hatchery, these are wild trout that swim away lazily at the approach of the canoe. Lee prefers to wait, and this deep spring run, like almost all of Newfoundland's trout streams, can be fished by wading. The fly goes out to a likely spot and is retrieved with an erratic motion. There is no strike this time, but the shadowy forms of two trouts follow the fly and then turn away at the last moment. The fly goes out to the same spot a second time. A big trout strikes at the fly and misses, then comes swiftly on to get the fly just off the tip of the rod, a strike to bring an angler's heart right up into his throat. Lee Wolf has long been one of the foremost advocates of light tackle, and for this fishing he is using a two and a half ounce seven foot fly rod with a balanced line and reel. Such tackle gives the fish every opportunity to break free if he can catch the fisherman in an unguarded moment, or if he can foul the line on one of the many submerged roots and logs. Here, Lee very 
release the tension by the pressure of his fingers on the line as it passes through them. The deep water makes wading difficult, but the angler must stay close to his fish. If too much line is taken off the reel, it is almost certain to result in a tangle. This is a truly big trout, typical of the larger fish to be found in many of Newfoundland's lakes and rivers. A trout so large that Lee has difficulty in fitting it into the net. Here's a six and a half pounder to fulfill the guide's predictions and the angler's fondest dream. A beautiful brook trout in a beautiful setting. A symbol of perfect sport, as well as a real treat at lunchtime when brown to a turn over an open fire by a capable guide. Newfoundland is surrounded by the sea with its rich bounty of food. And a large share of the province's trout make feeding trips to the salt water. At any pool near a river's mouth, an angler may be surprised by a sudden strike from one of these sturdy sea-run eastern brook trout, recently returned from a period of sea feeding. The Newfoundlanders call them sea trout. The fight of the sea-run trout is similar to that of his cousins who stay in the lakes and rivers. It features plenty of surface surges, many long and powerful runs in the deep water, but few leaps that clear the surface completely. However, the abundance of food in the sea seems to give these fish an extra store of strength and power, making their capture especially exciting. These trout take on the natural protective coloring of all the free-swimming ocean fish whenever they go to sea. Their backs remain dark but their sides and bellies turn shimmering silver, reflecting the sunlight whenever one turns on his side. This bright and shining coat will gradually revert to the more vivid natural stream coloring within a few weeks after the return to fresh water. Sea run trout tend to make their migrations in schools which stay together even after returning to fresh water. In the pool, where one five-pounder such as this is caught, there may be a dozen more just like it. Each one is like the other as peas in a pod. Lee Wolf draws a strike that bends his fly rod down in a curving arc as he casts his fly out into the open waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. For it is possible to fish for these migratory brook trout right out in the sea itself. It is a unique experience to play a heavy trout on fly fishing tackle in a rolling surf. And it is in the salt water that the largest fish spend much of their time. Like all true sportsmen, Lee never keeps more fish than he needs. And this beautiful silvery fontanalis comes in through the surf to the sandy beach only to be unhooked and returned unharmed to the open waters of the sea. The mackerel is a good game fish itself on light tackle. But here we have Lee Wolf preparing one of them, along with its counterpart, a herring, as baits for the big bluefin tuna which summer in Newfoundland's coastal waters. When the baits are finished, they must be tested to make sure they will troll with a swimming motion and do not spin. Outriggers will make the bait skip over the surface as if they were trying frantically to escape, an action particularly attractive to tuna. Here in the quiet bays and runs between the islands, the huge blue fins can be seen breaking the surface as they feed. A school of squid playing on the surface may indicate tuna cruising in the depths beneath them. The 
long outrigger bends down and the line snaps free as the tuna takes the bait. Lee leaps into the swivel chair to set the hook. The crew swings into action and the boat turns to follow the fish while the reel sings under the pressure of the first wild run. Tuna fishing is a team sport wherein a crew works together to capture a giant fish. Each member of the crew has his part to play and an error by anyone could result in the loss of the fish. It is a virile sport, a test of the angler's strength and staying power as well as his skill with the tackle. One of the largest and fastest of the big ocean roving fish, the tuna fights hard and long, using his great speed and long runs beneath the surface. A strain of less than 100 pounds will break the line that holds him, and the boat must follow each run, closing in whenever the tuna stops or slows down, in order to stay within the 600 yards length of the line. At the end of an hour and a half of fast action, this 630-pound tuna, typical of the Newfoundland run, comes to gap and is secured. A handsome reward for a fisherman who loves the tang of the salt air and a rugged struggle for a man-sized trophy. Tuna are casual summer visitors to Newfoundland, following the great schools of herring, mackerel, and squid to their points of greatest abundance. The years ahead hold promise of consistent angling opportunity for these great rovers of the sea. The sight of the fin and tail of a broad-billed swordfish, often seen breaking the surface in Newfoundland's bays and coastal waters, is something to quicken the pulse of even the most sophisticated big game fisherman. For here is his trophy of trophies. On his first strike, this swordfish fails to break the line free from the outrigger, but a moment later the line snaps from the pin. After a pause to let the swordfish take the bait into his mouth, our angler strikes. There's an answering surge from the fish. Lee lifts his rod again to set the hook more securely, but this time there's no answering pressure. The fish is gone. The hook failed to find a solid hold in the soft mouth of the swordfish. As every fisherman knows to his sorrow, it's always the big ones that get away. Moving from sea to Salmon River, Lee ties one of his famous white wolf dry flies to the end of a 14-foot leader, and then casts it out to the rippling flow where the salmon are lying. Like a floating insect, the fly drifts along freely. When a salmon takes the fly, a quick lift of the rod sets the hook. Rapid reeling takes up the casting slack immediately after the strike in order to play the salmon directly from the reel. Lee's tackle consists of a nine-foot fly rod and the reel holds a balanced fly line attached to 150 yards of backing. This is normal tackle for most of Newfoundland salmon fishing. The Atlantic salmon returning from the sea is blessed with a sense of the limitless space of the ocean. His runs are longer and his leaps are higher than those of other fish that spend their entire lives in small pools or ponds. The returning salmon is supercharged with energy, for he has stored up enough strength in his silvery body to carry him through nearly a year of starvation. Hunger leaves him when he returns to his stream, for in it, the only available food for him would be young salmon. Having no appetite, he takes a fly only occasionally, through a whim, when a perfect presentation is made. For these and other reasons, discriminating anglers call him the king of fly rod fish, top trophy in individual angling. When this salmon heads downstream, adding the current speed to his own, Lee has no choice but to follow as fast as he can if he is to save his fish. Should the salmon get too far below him, the long line will twist in the turbulent flow and be almost certain to catch on a protruding rock, thus giving the fish a steady pull against the leader and letting him break away. An angler should play his fish from a downstream position, and as soon as possible, Lee gets below the fish again, pulling him farther downstream making him work against the flow of the current as well as the full force of the tackle until a stretch of quiet water is reached where he can be handled more easily. 
When the tired fish is brought under complete control, Lee sets up his salmon tailor, another of his angling inventions. The spring bowl passes up over the salmon's tail and is pressed against his body. The noose tightens in a secure grip, holding the struggling salmon without injury. A 10-pound fish just in from the ocean. Removing the fly from the salmon's jaw, Lee sets the gallant fish free, and a true conservationist makes a worthy contribution to the salmon fishing of the future. The powerful surge of a really big Atlantic salmon is something no angler can ever forget. The sight of his flashing leaps etches indelibly on an angler's memory. No other fish offers the fly rod fisherman so much power and speed in a combination of brilliant and flashing action. No other fish calls for quite so much skill with delicate tackle, nor brings so much satisfaction with success. For this fishing, Lee Wolf is using a two and a half ounce fly rod, a light rod for any fishing, and extremely light for the challenge of this large Atlantic salmon. The delicate seven-foot fly rod cushions the shock of each swirling drive. Light pressure is used when the fish races off on a run, and complete slack is given for each spectacular leap. When the run is over, the rod is lifted upward, and Lee reels in as long as the limiting strength of the three-pound test leader can draw the fish closer. Under this skillful tackle play, the great fish tires but in answer to the angler's challenge, makes the last long run against the current, from the tail of the pool far up into the deep, dark waters. For safety, the salmon depends upon his speed and strength, and does not seek to escape by hiding under a rock or snake. He fights in the open water, and when his strength is spent and the run is ended, the tackle's easy pressure will bring him back to the shallow flow again. And now Lee sets up his tailor in order to land him when the right moment arrives. Although canoes or boats are used on some of the larger rivers, most of Newfoundland salmon are found in small intimate streams where the angler can wade and follow his fish. Long casts are not necessary, and ordinary trout tackle with the addition of a hundred yards or more of backing line is adequate for this fishing. Fly fishing is the only allowable method of taking salmon in the Newfoundland rivers. All fishing waters are open to licensed anglers and offer the finest of fly fishing at a moderate cost. The very weight of this fish makes him hard to handle and hold. He must be guided rather than pulled and must be allowed to go pretty much where he wishes until his strength is gone. This is a salmon to remember, hooked on a dry fly and played to perfection on a featherweight rod until complete exhaustion lets the fisherman bring him within reach of the tailor. Lee Wolf here demonstrates the angling skill for which he is so well known. Having hooked, played, and landed a 30-pound Newfoundland salmon unaided in just 26 and a half minutes. One of the greatest thrills of his long angling career. No testimonial to the Atlantic salmon's speed and power can equal the sight of these bright, glistening fish as they leap the falls on their return trip to their native pools at the headwaters of the stream. These are the big falls of the famous Humber River, a 14-foot barrier across the river's flow. At this time, few of the salmon are able to make the high leap. After many days of rain, the river is in flood, and the fish lack a good foundation for their leaps, because churning foam has replaced the usual solid water at the foot of the falls. Although the conditions are difficult and their chances slim, these eager fish 
too impatient to wait for more favorable water conditions, cannot help trying to surmount this barrier. With thousands of fish pressing upstream from the sea and temporarily held up at the base of these falls, there is a constant stream of shining fish coming out into the air. In a day or two, when the river drops to normal flow, 99% of these fish will be able to leap the ledge and continue on upstream to the spawning ground. The sight of these magnificent fish pitting their strength against the forces of nature is one of Newfoundland's outstanding scenic attractions. has been a cross-section of fishing amid the grandeur and rugged beauty of Newfoundland, where sport is at its finest. This is Kurt Gowdy for the North American Outdoorsman. Here are some scenes from a few of our other action-packed video classics. Programs you'll want to add to your video library. Whitetail, one of the finest whitetail films ever made, with a rare look at an elusive white buck. This video will stand the test of time. Soliloquy to a Salmon, a reflection of Lee Wolf's thoughts as he plays and releases an 18-pound Atlantic salmon on Quebec's St. John River. Courageous Lake Caribou, Leonard Clark and his guide Albert Fish trek across the barren grounds of Canada's Northwest Territories in search of a trophy caribou. As an added spice, Leonard gets into some virgin fishing for Arctic char, lake trout, and northern pike. Giant tuna small boat. Take Lee Wolf, a 16-foot Boston whaler, 80-pound test line, and a 650-pound bluefin. Add them up for the excitement this video offers. Big Three in Newfoundland. One video that has it all. Moose, woodland caribou, and black bear on their native turf in the beautiful Long Range Mountains. Ungava Char. Ross Carpenter, his Eskimo guides, Arctic Char, and a land yet unspoiled are the recipe for this unforgettable adventure in Quebec's subarctic. To Ecuador for Marlin. Lee and Joan Wolf probe the Humboldt current for striped marlin and Pacific sailfish. Joan's marlin makes 15 consecutive jumps in a single run of the camera. This is an action plus video. Upland Gunner. Travel with Lee Wolf to Maine, Georgia, Oregon, and Missouri in pursuit of upland game birds. This video features excellent dog work and fine shooting. Atlantic Salmon at Helen's Falls. Gene Hill, Jim Rickoff, and Tom Hennessy share the beauty and the bounty on one of the best salmon rivers in the world. Fly Fisherman's World. Trout, Atlantic Salmon, Tarpon, and Pacific Sailfish are the species. Montana, Labrador, Florida, and Panama are the locations. Put Lee Wolf in the picture, and it's a must for your video library. Flashing Silver. Fly fishing for coho in British Columbia. A fine video with unbelievable jumping action and underwater photography that is unsurpassed. Dead River Rough Cut. A unique film of two woodsmen who live in the northern Maine wilderness. Running counterpoint to the sink action of the video are their reflections on women, politics, death and taxes in their own. Sometimes profane words. Awarded the Red Ribbon American Film Festival. The North American Outdoorsman Video Collection is available at most fine hunting and fishing stores or for credit card orders, call toll-free 1-800-331-6839. In Tennessee, it's 1-800-654-9269. Ask for Operator 2V or send check or money order to the North American Outdoorsman. Post Office Box 328, Department V, Clinton, Tennessee, 37716-0328.